Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to react to the long list for the Booker International Prize, the 13 titles that are longlisted for the Booker International, which is for translated literature, have been announced. I don't usually pay very close attention to this. I do kind of lightly follow it, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that it is usually timed fairly well with the Women's Prize, and then last year at this time, I was also doing the BookTube Prize, and I'm not doing the BookTube Prize this year, so I figured this would be a good thing to pay attention to this year and see how that goes. I am trying to read more translated literature, and I am participating in the LGBTQ in Translation read-along as part of that, but as an extension, I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the 13 books that are long-listed here, most of which are unfamiliar to me, and see if there are any that I would like to read. I am familiar with at least one of them, but a lot of these I'm going to be learning about for the first time as we kind of go through the list. I like kind of doing off immediate live reactions to them most of the time. Just looking at the Booker website, they say that this long list includes previous winners Olga Tokarczyk, who is the one that I'm familiar with because she is also a Nobel laureate, Jennifer Croft, David Grossman, and Jessica Cohen, alongside authors translated into English for the very first time. The shortlist, which is six books, will be announced on April 7th, and the winner will be announced on May 26th. The first book on the list is Paradise by Fernanda Melkor, translated by Sophie Hughes. I believe Fernanda Melkor was previously nominated for her last book, which was Hurricane Season, I believe. The description that they have is written in a chilling torrent of prose by one of Mexico's most thrilling new writers. Paradise explores the explosive fragility of Mexican society. Inside a luxurious housing complex, two misfit teenagers sneak around and get drunk. Franco Andrade, lonely, overweight, and addicted to porn, obsessively fantasizes about seducing his neighbor, an attractive married woman and mother. Meanwhile, Polo, the community's gardener, dreams about quitting his grueling job and fleeing his overbearing mother and their narco-controlled village. As each face the impossibility of getting what they think they deserve, together Franco and Polo hatch a mindless and macabre scheme. I heard very mixed reactions to her previous book. Part of that had to do with the fact that it was, from what I've heard, very violent. So this seems like it could go in that direction as well. I have not read it, but uh, this or her previous book. But it does sound interesting and I think it would be interesting to see what some people are saying about this. So it immediately grabs my attention, but I don't think I'm going to run out and look for a copy right now. It's just something I'm going to kind of note in my head and see if it falls into my path. Maybe if it makes the shortlist, I'll feel a little bit more likely to grab it. But I don't think I have any kind of urgent need to do it. Given that she has been shortlisted before, she seems like a strong contender to make the shortlist. But let's get through the rest of the list. The next one is Heaven, written by Mieko Kawakami, translated by Samuel Bett and David Boyd. I am familiar with the work of Mieko Kawakami because of the book Breasts and Eggs, which I've heard a lot of really good things about, but have not gotten around to reading yet. What they say about this one is told through the eyes of a 14-year-old boy subjected to relentless bullying. This is a haunting novel of the threat of violence that can stalk our teenage years. Instead of putting up resistance, the boy suffers in complete resignation. His sole ally is a girl classmate, similarly outcast and preyed upon by the bullies. They meet in secret to take solace in each other's company, unaware that their relationship has not gone unnoticed by their tormentors. Miyako Kawakami's deceptively simple yet profound work stands as a testament to her remarkable literary talent. Here she asks us to question the fate of the meek in a society that favors the strong and the lengths to which even children will go in their learned cruelty. That sounds really interesting. So I'm going to leave this tab open so I can circle back to it because I was very curious about breasts and eggs and that immediately grabs my attention as something that I would like, probably like to seek out. Let's go on to the next book, which is Love in the Big City by Sang Young Park and translated by Anton Herr. I took a quick look at this earlier and I believe Anton Herr has two nominations on this list. I, the cover of this book is immediately eye-catching, by the way. They say, an energetic, joyful, and moving novel that depicts both the glittering nighttime world of Seoul and the bleary-eyed morning after. Young is a cynical yet fun-loving Korean student who pinballs from home to class to the beats of recent Tinder matches. He and Jae-hee, his female best friend and roommate, frequent nearby bars. 
where they suppress their anxieties about their love lives, families, and money with rounds of saju and freezer-chilled Marlboro Reds. In time, even Jaehee settles down, leaving Young alone to care for his ailing mother and find companionship in his relationships with a series of men, including one whose handsomeness is matched by his coldness, and another who might end up being the great love of his life. Now that I'm reading the description, I have heard of this book before, and it sounded interesting to me. I think I have it written down somewhere as something to kind of keep my eye out for. I'm going to leave this tab open because it definitely ties in with my interests. It's probably something that I would like to read. So that one is definitely going on the pile of possibilities for this year. The next book is Happy Stories Mostly, written by Norman Erickson Passaribu, translated by Tiffany Tsao. A powerful blend of science fiction, absurdism, and alternative historical realism that aims to destabilize the heteronormative world and expose its underlying rot. I'm already interested. Inspired by Simone Weil's concept of decreation and drawing on Batak and Christian cultural elements in Happy Stories mostly, Pasai Ribu puts queer characters in situations and plots conventionally filled by hetero characters. Yeah, this really has my attention so far. In one story, a staff member is introduced to their new workplace, a department of heaven devoted to archiving unanswered prayers. In another, a woman's attempts to vacation in Vietnam after her gay son commits suicide turn into a nightmarish failed escape. And in a speculative historical third, a young man finds himself haunted by the tale of a giant living in a colonial era Sumatra. I'm really interested in that one. So that is another tab that I'm going to leave open. This seems like a really good list so far. I don't know what I expected. I think the, the booker generally has good taste, but I'm really impressed with the quality of the books so far. The next one is Elena Knows by Claudia Pinheiro, translated by Francis Riddle. A unique story that interweaves crime fiction with intimate details of morality and the search for individual freedom. After Rita is found dead in the bell tower of the church she used to attend, the official investigation into the incident is quite quickly closed. Her sickly mother is the only person still determined to find the culprit. Chronicling a difficult journey across the suburbs of the city, an old debt and a revealing conversation, Elena Knows unravels the secrets of its characters and the hidden facets of authoritarianism and hypocrisy in our society. That's another one that sounds really interesting. I'm going to end up leaving every tab open on this list because they all sound interesting to me. That's a good problem, to be clear, but it's, it's going to be a lot of books. Let's see what the next one has in store. That is The Book of Mother by Violaine Huseman, translated by Leslie Camhee. Violaine Huseman's remarkable debut novel is an exquisitely wrought story about a daughter's inextinguishable love for her magnetic, mercurial mother. Again, I'm immediately on the hook. <laughs> Beautiful and charismatic, Catherine, a.k.a. Maman, smokes too much, drives too fast, laughs too hard, and loves too extravagantly. During a joyful and chaotic childhood in Paris, her daughter Violaine wouldn't have it any other way. So the author's name Violaine and the character's name Violaine. Interesting. But when Maman is hospitalized after a third divorce and breakdown, everything changes. As the story of Catherine's own traumatic childhood and coming of age unfolds, the pieces come together to form an indelible portrait of a mother as irresistible as she is impossible, as triumphant as she is transgressive. Yeah, I'm going to end up leaving every single tab open because these all sound really interesting so far. What am I doing to myself? I should just stop right now. The next one is More Than I Love My Life by David Grossman, translated by Jessica Cohen. I believe they said that D David Grossman was one of the previous winners. He is. So there you go. A sweeping story about loving with courage that asks us to confront our deepest held beliefs about a woman's duty to herself and to her children. On a kibitz in 2008, Gilly is celebrating her, the 90th birthday of her grandmother Vera, the adored matriarch of a sprawling and tight-knit family. But festivities are interrupted by the arrival of Nina, the mother who abandoned Gilly as a baby. Nina's return precipitates an epic journey from Israel to the desolate island of Gali Otok, formerly part of Yugoslavia. It was here, five decades earlier, that Vera was tortured as a political prisoner. And it is here that the three women will finally come to terms with the terrible moral dilemma that Vera faced and that permanently altered the course of their lives. It's a problem because that sounds really interesting too. I will say it doesn't grab me as immediately as some of the other ones, maybe not as urgently, but still something that I would 
probably keep on my list to check out. So, so far, Paradise and that one I'm, I'm interested in, but a little less than the other one, two, three, four, five books that seem like instant pile of possibilities ads for me. The next one is Phenotypes by Paolo Scott, translated by Daniel Hahn. Paolo Scott delivers a smart and stylish account of the bigotry lurking in hearts and institutions alike. In this complex tale, two very different brothers of mixed black and white heritage are divided by the color of their skin as racial tension rises in society and a guilty secret resurfaces from their shared past. Paolo Scott here probes the old wounds of race in Brazil, and in particular the loss of, of black identity independent from the history of slavery. Exploratory rather than didactic, a story of crime, street life, and regret is much a satirical novel of ideas. Phenotypes is a seething masterpiece of rage and reconciliation. That also sounds fascinating. This is going to be a problem for me. I'm going to want every single one of these books. At some point, one of these is going to have to seem like a dud, right? All 13 can't be instant pile of possibilities ads, can they? Let's find out by going to the next one, which is A New Name, Septology 6 through 7, written by John Fossey and translated by Damien Searles. John Fossey delivers both a transcendent exploration of the human condition and a radically other reading experience, incantatory, hypnotic, and utterly unique. It's spelled A-S-L-E. I'm going to say Azel, but I don't know if that's correct. Is an aging painter who lives alone on the coast of Norway. His only friends are his neighbor, a traditional fisherman farmer, and Bayer, a gallerist who lives in the city. There lives another Azel. Also a painter, but lonely and consumed by alcohol. Assel and Assel are doppelgangers, two versions of the same person, two versions of the same life, both grappling with existential questions. Written in melodious and hypnotic slow prose, this is the final installment of Fossey's Septology, the major prose work by the Beckett of the 21st century, according to Le Monde. That sounds like it could be interesting. I wouldn't call it a dud. I said I was, I was waiting for the first dud. I wouldn't say this is a dud at all. I will say of the title so far, it's possibly the one I'm least interested in reading, but it does sound fascinating. It just sounds a little bit heavy, being honest. And that's the thing that's kind of giving me a little bit of pause. So this is the first one I'm gonna call for your feedback on. If you have read A New Name, Septology 6 through 7, or any of the previous volumes in this by John Fossey, translated by Damien Searles, let me know in the comment section down below. It sounds like it could be heavy, but it does sound interesting. So let me know if you've read it, what you thought of it. And it's not a no, but it, it's something that I would uh, want a little bit of feedback on before committing to either way. So I would appreciate any advice you could offer. The next book is After the Sun, written by Jonas Eicha and translated by Sherilyn Helberg. With irrepressible urgency, Aika's astonishing fix fiction just opposes startling beauty with grotesquerie and balances the hyper-realistic with the fantastical. After the Sun opens portals to our newest realities, haunting the margins of a globalized world that's both saturated with yearning and brutally transactional. Under Cancun's hard blue sky, a beach boy provides a canvas for tourists' desires, seeing deep into the world's underbelly. An enigmatic encounter in Copenhagen takes an IT consultant down a rabbit hole of speculation that proves more seductive than sex. Meanwhile, the collapse of a love triangle in London leads to a dangerous hypnotic addiction, and in the Nevada desert, a grieving man tries to merge with an unearthly machine. I think that sounds interesting, but I'm going to ask for feedback on that one as well. If you've read After the Sun, let me know what you thought of it down there, because it sounds like it doesn't quite align with my interest, which is fine. I think it's important to read things that don't align with your interest a fair amount of the time. So I'm not opposed to it, but it sounds like the kind of thing I probably wouldn't vibe with, especially the thing that gives me the biggest pause is the grieving man trying to merge with an unearthly machine. I tend to struggle with science fiction and fantasy and speculative fiction and all of that stuff. There are good stories within those realms, but I think I've had bad luck picking up ones that I didn't like in the past, and that's always make, made me a little bit skeptical of them. So that's probably where this book is running into a speed bump. And it sounds like it could be interesting, it could be great, the cover's fun, but uh, I am not immediately going to add it to my pile of possibilities for this year or anything like that. But if you'd like to change my mind, let me know why 
in the comment section down below. Let's go to the next book, which is Tomb of Sand, written by Gitanjali Shri, translated by Daisy Rockwell. An urgent yet engaging protest against the destructive impact of borders, whether between religions, countries, or genders. In northern India, an 80-year-old woman slips into a deep depression at the death of her husband, then resurfaces to gain a new lease of life. Her determination to fly in the face of convention confuses her bohemian daughter, who is used to thinking of herself as the more modern of the two. To her family's consternation, Ma then insists on traveling to Pakistan, confronting the unresolved trauma of her teenage experiences of partition. Despite its serious themes, Gitanjali Shri's light touch and exuberant wordplay ensures that Tomb of Sand remains constantly playful and utterly original. That sounds really interesting to me because the, you know, the story of a woman being more quote-unquote modern and going against what people expect of her. I love that kind of a story. It's a mother-daughter story. It's a story about generational trauma. Not really generational, but I, I guess the relationship with the mother and the daughter might reflect some of that. It's about historical injustice and historic trauma, I guess. So that all really appeals to me. It also makes me think of Rohinton Mysteries' book, A Fine Balance, which I loved. It was one of my favorite books in the year in which I read it. I love that book. So this is something that would pretty much instantly go on my pile of possibilities. We have two more. The next one is, I have seen it. It's a big brick of a book. It's The Books of Jacob, written by Olga Tukarczyk, translated by Jennifer Croft. Olga Tukarczyk, again, is a Nobel laureate. Olga Tukarczyk's portrayal of Enlightenment Europe on the cusp of precipitous change, searching for certainty and longing for transcendence. In the mid-18th century, as new ideas begin to sweep the continent, a young Jew of mysterious origins arrives in a village in Poland. Before long, he has changed not only his name, but his persona, visited by what seem to be ecstatic experiences. Jacob Frank casts a charismatic spell that attracts an increasingly fervent following. In the decade to come, Frank will traverse the Habsburg and Ottoman empires as he reinvents himself again and again. He converts to Islam and then Catholicism, is pilloried as a heretic and revered as the Messiah, and wreaks havoc on the conventional order with scandalous rumors of his secret rituals and the spread of his increasingly iconoclastic beliefs. I've heard really good things about this book so far. I believe in the United States it was only fairly recently released. But because of the size, and because I feel like I would want to pick up a previous book by Olga Tokarczyk, if I was going to make the leap into her work, which was uh, Drive the Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, I would hold on this one, but it sounds fascinating. So if you've read this one, and if you've read Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, let me know which one you would recommend starting with, because I am interested in getting to the work of Olga Tokarczyk at some point. I just don't know if this would be the book that I would use as a sort of entrance point. The last one is called Cursed Bunny, written by Bo Ra Chung, translated by Anton Hur, who is here for the second time. Bo Ra Chung presents a genre-defying collection of short stories which blur the lines between magical realism, horror, and science fiction. Korean author Bo Ra Chung uses elements of the fantastic and surreal to address the very real hor horrors and cruelties of patriarchy and capitalism in modern society. Anton Hur's translation skillfully captures the way Chung's prose effortlessly glides from the terrifying to the wryly humorous, winner of a Penheim grant. I have read books translated by Anton Hur before. I believe he's the translator of Kyung Suk Shin, and I've read two of her books so far. Uh, he, he is a great translator. So that sounds really interesting as well. It's not a very thorough blurb. There's not a whole lot of detail about it, but it sounds like it would be interesting. So I took a second and I went back through the list and picked the six books that I feel like I am most interested in reading, the ones that would be sort of instant pile of possibilities ads for me. And I'm not really going to do a full prediction on what's going to make the short list. I'm just going to leave it at this. But since there are six books that I would say would be pretty much instant pile of possibilities ads, I'm not going to say I'm going to run out and get them and read them immediately or before the shortlist is announced or before the prize is announced. But these are the ones I'm most interested in. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that these will be the six books that could make the shortlist, according to me, who knows nothing. <laughs> the first one is Heaven written by Mieko Kawakami, translated by Samuel Bett and David Boyd. Then there's Love in the Big City, written by Sang Young Park, translated by Anton Hur. And then Happy Stories Mostly, written by Norman Erickson Passarabu, translated by Tiffany Tsao. Then Elena Knows, written by Claudia Pinheiro, translated by Francis Riddle. Then we have Phenotypes, written by Paolo Scott and translated by Daniel Hahn. And then finally, 
for me, Tomb of Sand, written by Gitanjali Shri and translated by Daisy Rockwell. Those are the six books that most immediately jumped out to me. I would love to hear what you think about these books, this long list, what you think might make the short list, what you think should have been on the list. I'm not even going to hazard a guess about what was left off that should have made it here. Made it here. And I will say, part of why I haven't really paid attention to the Booker International Prize is because it just feels like my plate is full with book prizes, you know, with the Women's Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the Booker Prize, the Nobel Prize. It's a lot. But I think I need to make room in my life for the Booker International Prize and follow it a little more closely in the future because this is a really solid long list. There are a lot of books on here that I would be interested in reading. But again, I would love to hear your thoughts on this long list and what you think about it, if there's anything that jumped out to you. Let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.